we are live. Okay. All right, hello, um, you're welcome. If you can hear me wherever you are, uh, I would like you to just maybe send a thumbs up in the comment section of whichever platform you're using. Let's see um, if I can get a thumbs up. Yes, so I see some likes and thumbs up. So I believe you are live. A warmly welcome to this year's edition of um, Empowerment Conference. Uh, and even before I proceed any further, let me just quickly share a word of prayer and then we'll continue. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this day. We thank you um, in these times, especially because you've kept us alive. We thank you even for the privilege to sit at your feet and receive knowledge and insights. As we come to hear from you, we are praying that your spirit will grant us wisdom and understanding. You grant us a spirit of revelation Help us to become the lights in this generation. And even in these times, Lord, we will be relevant and impactful and will serve you in this generation. In the name of the Lord Jesus, have we prayed. Amen. Yes, so once again, you're warmly welcome to Empowerment Conference 2020. Um, and just before I proceed, I just want to give a little background about what Rescue World is and what Empowerment Conference specifically is about. And again, as I speak, just keep giving me thumbs up if you are there, so I know you are following, you are, you are, with, you are with me. Okay, so Rescue World is um, it's a, non, it's a not-for-profit organization that is aimed at spreading the um, good news of Jesus Christ and the matchless love of God. We organize outreaches and also offer humanitarian, um, humanitarian support to different communities um, over the years and through our evolution to become what is now Rescue World, we have had quite a number of um, street evangelism programs. We have visited orphanages. We've been to specific rural communities. We've been to the senior correctional institutes. We have um, hospitals and secondary schools in many different parts of the world, just sharing the gospel of Jesus um, offering humanitarian aid and things like that. And so that's what we're about. Um, it is headquartered in Ofanko in Accra under the leadership of our brother, Mr. Akwesi Yabwa Piaje, with a team of young men. We have partners and members and volunteers all across the world. Our programs are in two forms. Firstly, we have the outreaches, which I have talked about. We also have um, conferences. So our conferences are geared towards edifying Christians so that we can effectively execute our duty of sharing Jesus Christ. So we have breakfast meetings, which you hold regularly. We teach the word of God. We have a worship conference, prayer conference, camps. And we have what we are about today, which is the empowerment conference. And I'm sure you may ask wherever you may be that, why? Why an outreach ministry properly so-called we involve in something that seems to be geared more towards um, business and leadership and, you know, things things in that line. And this is why we do it. We believe that the Christian should be the light in whichever space he finds himself. He should share the glory of God and he should be an example. And work basically takes, our vocation takes a majority of our time in this life. And so a Christian must excel. There's a scripture in Daniel, I'll just read briefly. And it's in Daniel chapter 6. Uh, I'll read from verse verse number three. I'll read verse three and verse five. So verse three says that uh, this Daniel became distinguished among other presidents and satraps, and an excellent spirit was in him. An excellent spirit was in him. In verse five, it says, then these men said, we shall not find, verse four, sorry, verse four says that then the presidents, the satraps, sought to find ground for complaint against Daniel, with regard to the kingdom, but they could not find no ground for complaint on any fault because he was trustworthy. Two skills were found in Daniel, excellence and trustworthiness. Excellence and trustworthiness. He was excellent at his work and he was trustworthy, which means he delivered. 
So we believe that that's what a Christian should be. There should be no faults that will be found in us pertaining to our work. If we'll be able to shine the gospel of Jesus Christ and the glory of the Lord in our work as well. And that is why we gather, we do empowerment conference to learn how as Christians we can be relevant, excellent and impactful in our line of work. So I, do, I think that with this, we can quickly segue into our main purpose for today. Our world is faced with something that has that has not been seen in, in a very long time, if, if, not, not, if not ever at all. And it has changed our normal, has changed our work. And so as Christians, we need to ask, answer the same question. How can we be relevant and excellent and impactful in our line of vocation? And that is why today, even under the circumstances we are in and we are not able to meet physically, we still have two experts, I should say, um, in our midst. They will share with us. We will have the opportunity to ask questions and then we will proceed. So I'll go ahead straight away to introduce our first speaker. And before I do that, if you, I mean, just try and get in touch with a friend and brother, share the link. I mean, inform others. He's about to go live, and I don't want, to, want you to miss this at all. So, quickly, let me introduce our first speaker, Mr. Prince Buedu. So, Prince uh, currently leads the distribution requirements planning DRP team for Central, Eastern, South, East, Southern Europe, plus outside Europe sales for Personal Healthcare International Planning Service Center of Procter and Gamble in Germany. So Prince is based in Germany. That's interesting. One of the advantages we are getting out of this COVID-19 situation. I don't believe we'd have been able to have him if we were to have our usual fiscal meeting. Again, as an entrepreneur who is passionate about innovation and entrepreneurship in Africa, he's a co-founder co of MapTech and Kumasi Hive. And what MapTech does is that they leverage on the power of geographic information system, GIS, to solve business problems by developing and deploying such GIS-based application. Kumasi Hive, on the other hand, is an innovation hub that promotes the rapid prototyping of ideas, entrepreneurship, and youth development. The Hive, the Hive focuses on promoting collaboration among tenants within their co-working spaces and hardware facility. It's a radical shift from the usual software-centered hubs in Ghana. Interestingly, in 2016, Prince was named by Forbes Africa on the 30 under 30 list. He's the founder, he's the founding curator of TEDx Key and USD, a World Economic Forum Global Shaper, that's Kumasi Hub, and a fellow at the Africa Compt program. He served as a speaker in 2015 at the Atlantic Dialogues in Morocco, one of the 14 named emerging leaders from four continents across the Atlantic Basin, an initiative of the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the OCP policy center of morocco he's an active member of the ghana think foundation i'm sure you're already getting overwhelmed yes i have personally known prince since um, 2003 in my uh, high school days in infantry school and personally i have been very um motivated very encouraged and and i have admired his faith in the lord his his knock and his mind and his understanding on things about business and leadership and i consider it a great privilege and honor to invite prince to speak and so i want you to prepare your heart so with um with thumbs ups and with comments and with anything you can do on the platform you are watching us on i'd like you to welcome prince and please make sure you pick something as we proceed at the end of his presentation we'll have a few minutes of questions and then proceed straight away to um, the second speaker. Then we'll have a more comprehensive period of questions. So, Prince. Um, yes. <laughs> you're, yours. you're warmly welcome. Yes, thank you. And I'm ready personally to receive whatever you have to give to us. Thank you very much, Percy, for um, for this. Um, I, I didn't know you were going to read uh, our profiles. <laughs> I would have just sent my name, and that's it. I usually get. Um, yeah, I try to stay behind the scenes most of the time. But yeah, thanks, thanks really. And thank you guys for everyone for also joining um, today's um, session. So I'll quickly share my screen and I have some slides that I would want us to go through. And um, hopefully, like you rightly said, we would be able to, 
to learn a thing or two. So let me know if my screen is popping up. Um, yes, I think it's live. I can see it. Okay, okay, awesome. So today's session, like you rightly mentioned, I mean, when I got the invitation to really talk about um, the future of work, um, I know a lot of times within the context of the Christian domain, a lot of times we, we, a lot of Christians are out of touch with what is happening um, as far as technology, innovation, business, and society as a whole is concerned. We kind of are confined to this bubble where you know we, as much as possible, a lot of people that I talk to, especially, just don't care about what is happening. But you see, the the evolution that is happening, it, it doesn't respect your religion. It doesn't respect your belief system. I mean, with, in the face of COVID-19, whether you like it or not, if your company says you have to work from home, you yeah. would work from home. Yeah. You know, so. For me, this conference, and this is why, I mean, when you, you, you reached out to me, I said, yeah, I'm going to do this because it's important. So I'm going to share a few things with, with all of you. It's, it's from based on my experiences and also based on um, a few things that I've observed um, around me. I would start off, first of all, talking about mega trends. So I would, I would just make us look at what are the mega trends we should expect. And this, like I said, is ubiquitous. Whether it, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or you're a Muslim, these mega trends are coming, and for some, they're already here. So we'll, we'll touch base on that. And then next, I would look at what are the essential toolkits that we need as Christians, as people in general, um, who are going to experience these trends. What, what, what is the set of toolkit that we need? And then finally, we'll look at what the next steps um, should be for us as people. So let's uh, zoom into the, um, the presentation. Now, I, I, I titled this, The Future Happened Yesterday. You mm -hmm. see, there's, there's an, a, a new a redefinition of what the future is. And I remember growing up, we always saw the future as something we looked forward to. So tomorrow, next week is the future. But in the world that we live in now, the future actually happened yesterday, and you get to know why I, I say so. So I want us to just forget about everything. If you have been distracted wherever you are, just find a very quiet place, and let's really zoom into what I mean by the future happened yesterday. In the face of artificial intelligence, I mean, we've all heard about artificial intelligence. We've, we've heard about the fact that there's, there's a, complete, a complete paradigm shift from what we know as intelligence growing up um, if you're intelligent, um, so like Kwesi, for example, <laughs> I wish I had his brains, but someone like Kwesi, if you're intelligent, it means you had six A's in your, in your WASI or you had eight A's, or your ability to uh, regurgitate everything you have studied, you know, and so forth. So that was the definition of intelligence. You know, really the human being has been the focus of intelligence for so many um, centuries. Whenever we heard of intelligence, we talked about um, Albert Einstein. We, we talked about Johann Sebastian Bach. We, we, we talked about really uh, uh, um, people um, or human beings, you know, in general, when we talk about intelligence. But now there's something called artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. right? And I will delve deeper. I also would look at um, one of the major uh, mega shifts, right, um, um, would be um, focused on clean uh, technology or clean tech. Right, so from the way the world is going, everything is geared towards EVs, for example. So we'll look a little bit about that as well. And I will delve next into the gig economy. So we live in an economy now where people um, are redefining what it means to be employed. So employment in itself has been redefined. And um, I remember one time listening to Professor Eddie Obin in his TED talk, and he talked about the fact that whenever you go to sleep, the world that was, you know, uh, realistic to you at the time that you're going to sleep no longer exists when you wake up. This is why I say the future happened yesterday. So the time, at the time you're going to sleep each night, you go to sleep in a specific kind of world. And by the time you wake up the following day, that world no longer exists, right? So we look at the gig economy. And then one of my favorites is robotics and automation. We look, um, I, I also look at that and then who we'll look a little bit about um, Internet of Things and how connectedness 
is going to redefine the way we live um, going forward. Now, I decided to, to really tell a story with artificial intelligence. Now, there's a game called Go. That's the name of the game. It's called Go. And it's one, it's actually the oldest game that has been played for so many years. In fact, this game is estimated to have been in existence for about 2,500 years. And there's this man in South Korea called Lee Sido. He He's fantastic. He's noted to be extremely intelligent and has held 18 world titles in this game called Go. I mean, no one could unseat this guy. I mean, he's fantastic. He plays the game like no other. In 2016, a company called DeepMind said, okay, we have developed an artificial intelligence and we want to um, arrange a match between Lee Sedo and this artificial intelligence called AlphaGo. Now, this is so fantastic and I get excited always talking about this. Now, listen, um, Lee Sedo has had 24 years at a time of experience playing this game. At the age of nine years, he would be trained from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day for 24 years. He knows this game inside out. Then this um, company called DeepMind developed this um, artificial intelligence, which was barely like a year and a half, two years maximum old. I mean, if, if, if only we could assign age to artificial intelligence, but yeah. And they arranged this match. And it's so fascinating. The team from the UK DeepMind flew to South Korea and this event was televised live. 100 million people watched this match. It's going to be a five day event, each day for one game, because the game is a game of strategy and it takes usually like an, an entire day. So Lee Sido in a pre-game interview said, well, he, he knows that he's going to win um, for sure. And the developers of AlphaGo were not sure because this is an AI. So for those of you who are wondering what AI is, so usually an artificial intelligence has its own learning process, right? So these algorithms are developed and the, um, the artificial intelligence learns by itself, right, with a lot of data. So even the developers were not sure because, I mean, Lee Sidor is like the god when it comes to um, Go. So fast forward, the game happened. Day one, Lee Sidor lost. Mm. Then day two, day three, day four, day five. I'm not going to tell you the outcome. You see the outcome. But what is most important, what we need to understand here is that their definition of intelligence has changed. So this is Lee Sido and this is AlphaGo. Now, what also is amazing is there was a price on this game, $1 million. Of course, an artificial intelligence does not need money. It's artificial. But Lee Sido needs it. He's, he's married and has a daughter. So you realize that the dynamics really is completely different. And this is what humankind is going to or would have to contend with. Now, the game went on. 100 million people watched this game. And what is important is who won? The game ended 4-1. I said on day one, AlphaGo won. So the question is who won at the end of the day? Let's look at this. DeepMind won four games out of the five games, and Lee Sido won just one. Now, I watched the post-game interview. And by the way, just last year, Lee Sido retired because of AlphaGo. Because Lee Sido was actually the epitome of the Go game. I mean, this guy was like the icon. And he said um, when he was retiring that he finds that no human being can beat um, DeepMind and the AlphaGo program from DeepMind. He says, no one, it's not possible. And the one game that he won, he made a move. There's a specific move. It's called the God move. It's one of the moves that no one had ever seen in the 2,500 years that this game has been played. No one has ever seen. But Lee Sido was able to pull that move, uh, move off and he won one game. Now, this makes it very important for you to understand that an algorithmic intelligence vis-a-vis -a, -vis a human intelligence. You see, the one move that he made won him one game and that move had never been done. So it still tells you that although there's the existence of artificial intelligence, 
the human intelligence, there's something about it called creativity that can never be replaced by an artificial intelligence. So this is the world that we are going, this is one huge major shift, a uh, mega trend that we should look out for. It's definitely going to be artificial intelligence everywhere, already it's happening, but the scale is going to increase. Now I say this, that data is the new raw material. I still see a lot of, for example, in most developing countries, a lot of governments depending on raw materials. So in this case, the gold, the diamond, the timber, we still think that those are raw materials. Those are not the raw materials anymore. It is data. How did AlphaGo win this game? The developers from DeepMind really made AlphaGo watch over 200,000 games over and over and over again. And as the artificial intelligence was watching, it was um, able to come up with its own unique approach to playing the game based on data. Again, even if we look at COVID-19, the countries with the data, very well consolidated data, are able to tackle um, this COVID-19 better than countries without data. So data is the new raw material, and this is very important. The next mega trend is climate change or clean tech. Um, as you, 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 all, you all know, I mean, the environment is at the pivot of any form of conference or any form of uh, meetings these days. People are talking about the environment, the environmental degradation and so forth. In the next decade, there's going to be even a lot more focus on clean tech. You can see, for example, that Tesla now is more valuable than General Motors. General Motors has been in existence for hundreds of years. Tesla is a few years old, but it's more vulnerable. Why? Because of electric vehicles. So there's going to be a shift in electric vehicles. There's going to be a shift from just people buying products to the, what I call the ethical consumer. So consumer who is more, um, let's say, um, very conscious of the environmental impact of whatever product or services they're consuming. Then the next thing I, I, I decided to talk about is what I, I love biomimicry architecture. Basically, in, in, in simple terms, these are buildings that can breathe, <laughs> basically. So imagine that you are building, you know, um, uh, or constructing a building that has properties of living things, right, incorporated into it, right? So these, these are the, the, the kind of technologies that are going to come up, and there's a whole lot more, but for each point, I just touch on two, that are going to come up as a mega trend, and it's already happening <clears throat> and, and in, in our world uh, today. <clears throat> the gig economy fascinates me. There's a website called Fiverr. So for those of you um, who, um, are, are, I mean, do a lot of um, freelancing, you probably have heard of it. So Fiverr is F-I-V-E-R-R, -R, so Fiverr.com. Now, this, this is a typical example of the gig economy, where people just want to work on gigs, basically, right? So people don't want to, especially millennials, don't want to be tied down to an 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. job, right? They want to put their skill sets online, and whenever you need them, so it's really a, a projectized approach mm -hmm. to executing mm -hmm. the work, right? So people are going to really, um, the gig economy is going to be, more uh, pervasive, right? So you go to Fiverr, and I've used Fiverr uh, a lot of times, and you just go to Fiverr and then you type, for example, logo design, you get at least thousands of um, 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 uh, graphic designers who can do your logo, and they are each competing on, on price and delivery and so forth. So it creates a competitive environment, even for the consumer or for, or for uh, the customer to get value for money. Because if, if you are on, on Fiverr, for example, and you know for logo one, your competitor is charging $9 um, and it's delivering in two days, you would say, okay, I've charged $8, I'll deliver in one, in, in, in one day, for example. So there's value for money that's being created. And also the gig economy is ensuring this remote working. And I, for example, have been working from home since March in the face of COVID-19, right? And I only resumed um, work to the office this week. And even that, there's a kind of a shift system that we are using. But, but, but this is so important. And it's because of COVID-19, big corporations are now beginning to embrace remote working. But 
believe you me, entrepreneurs and people, the millennials, have been doing this remote working for years. And this is going to be more pervasive as we go forward. Again, one other thing that um, COVID-19 has, has presented to us is that a lot more companies have realized that there's a, it's a huge cut on, on expenditure because of um, remote working. Because for many um, meetings, they would have to fly executives in first class mm -hmm. from one region to another. So remember, each time you fly, you leave a carbon footprint. So I mean, companies are saying that, okay, well, this COVID-19, I mean, it has this kind of a good side in a way because one, there's less flights. It means that there's less you know, impact on the environment, right? Yeah. Secondly, they are cutting down on a lot of logistical costs. Right? So this is this is um, definitely a, a mega trend. Now, I love robotics and automation. And, and as um, Chrissy said, um, I mean, I, I, I co-founded Commercial Hive and we do a lot of 3D printing, additive manufacturing and so forth. Now, by 2035, 50% of tasks will be completely automated, right? So, for example, um, I, I, I was reading a, a scientific paper the other time, and this is really fantastic. There, there's, there's a law firm in the US that is currently using um, an AI to really do um, some form of uh, case analysis. So this AI is able to do uh, like a thousand cases in under a minute, right? A human being would take at least 100 days, at least 100 days to do the same amount of cases. So, so you, you, you imagine what is happening in terms of the automized processes and tasks, it is gonna happen. And if you are in any form of uh, employment or any, uh, you know, if you're after school, you're thinking about what to do, have this in your mind that the world you live in is changing so rapidly that robots are going to substitute a lot of the routine tasks, right? So I'll, in, in further on, I'll show you what how we can address this. But this is a serious mega shift. I mean, uh, Chrissy said, I mean, I work in, in supply chain management. And when you go to our warehouses, you're talking about a huge warehouse, right? Spanning you know, miles, and sometimes you can go and then there's only two human beings. Every other thing is robots. So just robots, everything automized. So the order fulfillment, I mean, you check even Amazon warehouses, the order fulfillment process is completely automized, right? It's auto automated and everything is just happening autonomously. An order comes in, right? Goes to a computer, you know, and then all the robots are, are informed and then the ro robot with the closest proximity to the item just goes, picks it, and then delivers it, and so forth. So these things are happening now, it's and it's going to even happen a lot more. And there's one other thing maybe I should add about additive manufacturing and DIY. So that's mm -hmm. the do-it-yourself movement. And this is also important. Um, this shift is already happening. Like I said, we do this in Kumasi High, but it's going to happen more. I mean, in the U.S., people are already um, are, are printing their own guns at home, for example, mm -hmm. right? So even in medicine, there's going to be certain components that very soon you'll be able to print at home, right? And there are so many other aspects where in terms of emergencies and so forth, I mean, even in COVID-19, um, the respirators and stuff like that, in Italy, there, there's a young guy who you know, invented um, a printing process to, to print some of the components that were um, um, in shortage. So this is really uh, important uh, about 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Next, I want to re reinforce that we are going to be more connected, more, more than we can ever imagine. I mean, think about this. Uh, like Chrissy said earlier, I mean, for all those of us watching, we are in different locations, but because of technology, we have all come together under one platform, right? So eventually geography is not going to be relevant anymore. Like, it doesn't matter. There's going to be a time where if you tell me because you are in Kumasi, you can't come for the meeting, I would not understand what you mean because there's going to be a platform for you to, to join the meeting anyways. Now, when you talk about Internet of Things, it's got to do with your devices being able to connect, right, first to each other. So devices can communicate with each other, one, and devices connected to the cloud. So... Here now, Samsung has a refrigerator, for example. Now, the refrigerator is able to assess your groceries or whatever content is in there and tells you when your milk, for example, is running out. And the fridge can place an order ahead of time. 
knowing the lead time. So for example, if the milk takes two days to, to be delivered, for example, the, this refrigerator would already know that it takes two days. So let's say three days to, to the time where the, 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 um, the milk gets to the lowest um, 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 volume, it places an order. Or even mm. your car, if a component yeah. of your vehicle has to do, do planned maintenance, Right, this is going to happen anyway. Maybe every two weeks you change your tire. Your car can already place an order ahead of time, right, on your behalf without you doing anything. <laughs> and then, um, the, the of course, you get a notification and you do the payment. But the ordering process can be done by the vehicle. Now, when all these things are happening, what 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 is going to happen is that data will become the new gold because when devices are connected, they collect data. Data is being exchanged. Data is being collected data is being shared, right? And this data is what is going to be the next goal. It's going to be what is going, like I said, data is the new raw material. It's going to be the key raw material for redefining success. I mean, of course, there's cloud computing, like I mentioned, so AWS and Amazon Web Services. Um, if you look at the fact that um, I'm doing this presentation completely in the cloud, for example, right? So I prepared this uh, slides all in the, in the cloud and I'm presenting in the cloud. I don't have it on my, my laptop, um, um, for example. So these things are definitely going to happen. Amazing stuff. Now, we've looked at the mega trends. Now, let's look at the essential toolkits. What skills are needed? Remember, in the first instance, I said the future happened yesterday. Yeah. So the question is, if you are still hoping that the future is tomorrow, then you're already behind the world, right? You're actually lagging, right? So what skills are therefore needed? I'm going to focus on just four of the skills, there's a host of them. The first one I'm going to talk about is problem solving. We also mm -hmm. look at why it's essential to have a problem solving skill. This is super critical. Like I said, for most of the um, automated processes, usually they're for routine stuff. Yeah. So if you're going to move um, a box of, of plantain from point A to point B, easily automated a robot can just come and do it right but <laughs> when it comes to for example you designing that that same plantain is it ripe enough is it the right is it ripe enough for my taste i mean these are things that are very subjective so the subjective preferences cannot easily be automated and this is where human beings come in for example i like my fried plantain in a specific way right i can't just give that to a robot at least for now until we get to that stage. Yeah. So these are you know, still gaps that we can, we can still um, take advantage of. So problem solving skills, and then we're going to look at collaboration. Like what we're doing now, we are collaborating to, yeah. to some extent, right? So Chrisis uh, reached out to me, everything was done virtually. Yeah. We didn't have to meet in person. So we're going to look about collaboration. You need to be conscious of this. And creativity, super essential. I remember growing up, um, our parents used to tell us that, um, when you're going to the, the uh, you're going to senior high school, make sure you, you you get good grades to do science. Yeah. Right. So that was that was all for most of us. It was about science. But if you're watching this and you have a child, you know, start start thinking. Probably let them do visual arts. And I'll come I'll come <laughs> I'll come to that because initially the idea was I mean if you don't get good grades you do visual arts. But from the way things are going and from the experiences and exposure <laughs> that I'm having. You, you probably want them to do visual arts, and I'll come, I'll come to that. And then we talk about technological literacy. You need to be aware of the technologies that are happening. Now, what do I mean by problem solving skills? Problems are opportunities, right? So the first thing about problems is that a lot of us misconstrue problems as, you know, as this, you know, entanglement, you know, and there's no issue, there's no solutions, and, and mm -hmm. especially in Ghana, so many problems. Yeah. And we see the problems, and all we do is to just complain. complain. But yeah. problems are actually opportunities, right? And it's, it's so essential that the way we, we groom our kids or the way we get educated really influences our perception of what a problem is. So here, a um, former US uh, Secretary of Education said this, that we are currently preparing students for jobs and technologies that don't yet exist. Remember that in Ghana, we are preparing our students for jobs that exist. Mm -hmm. That's why, for example, I mean, <laughs> we know that, okay, so growing up, we will tell you, okay, um, there are a lot of banks, so try and read banking and finance. 
So yeah. you realize that for our kind of society, we are always preparing our gen younger generation for opportunities that exist. But remember I told you that the future happened yesterday. So each time you are telling your child to read medicine because they are hospitals, you've already failed that child, right? Mm -hmm. You should have a bigger reason than mm -hmm. that, for example, right? So this, this, is the, this is the US saying that they are preparing their students for technologies that don't exist in order to solve problems that we don't even know are problems yet. So there are problems, for example, had it not been for COVID-19, we did not know a lot of the problems that, I mean, we are now seeing, we never knew existed. Like mm. for example, this remote working that I alluded to, right? A lot of um, companies then had to get Microsoft Teams or WebEx, you know, try to buy the enterprise versions and stuff like that, right? And a lot of them also are now beginning to see that, okay, so we can reduce our carbon footprint and get a better profile as far as the environment is concerned by, by doing remote working. So a lot of problems don't yet exist. And other economies are preparing their students for those problems that don't exist. And what do you call that in Christendom? It's faith, substance yeah. of things hoped for, the for. evidence of things not seen, right? Yeah. So you realize that this is very practical. Like the Bible is very practical. We need to apply faith in some of these things whether you're doing business or whatever. Sometimes the Holy Spirit tells you to, to, to start a business. And you're like, there's no market for it. Do it. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is so important. Problems are opportunities. Collaboration. Like I, I said earlier, I mean, I, 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 I'm fortunate to, to have been part of a very huge uh, transition project. It's um, worth about, I think, $4 billion um, or so. And in, in this transition, I was part of the, the, the transition team. We did the transition from, from one company to another, from one system to another. We did everything remotely. We were all working from home. Imagine a $4 billion project. We executed remotely. And you need to have this mindset that you, you are not, you are as brilliant as your collaborators. Mm. You know, in Ghana, it's all, all about being able to top your class. It's, it's yeah. fun. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. I mean, people like we see them, so we're always <laughs> talking their class. So, so it's, it's, it's good. But you see, for, for what we are going, remember I shared the mega trends. What yeah. we need to do now, the kind of mindset we should have is a collaborative teamwork yeah. mindset. Teamwork. So I said that teamwork replaces individual brilliance. Yeah. So, and this is so important that companies are no longer battling or competing on product level. Companies are not competing supply chain against supply chain. And supply chain is, re is really defined simply as a team of companies working together to develop, a, a, to, to deliver a, pro a product to a, an end user. So collaboration. So Apple and Samsung are no longer just fighting or competing on the device. That's, what, that's why you realize that if you look at the updates over the years, the updates are not radical. They are just incremental because the focus is not really on the product, it's on the supply chain. Would Apple be able to deliver on time? On time. <laughs> would, 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 would Foxconn in, 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 in China be able to assemble the components on time, That's right? It. And if, if, if the design is done, the co-creation process, the, the concurrent engineering that has to happen, right, would it happen on time? So it's all about collaboration. So companies are now competing supply chain against supply chain. For example, let's, let's bring it to our local the woman who sells, I, at, at a point, I was selling Kelewole with my mom, right, back in Ghana. Now, take the Kelewole seller, right? Now, what, once, the, once the, um, the, the supplier, the market woman who get, goes to the village to get a plantain, mm -hmm. once that supply chain is disrupted, the Kelewole seller is out of the it's job. Out of business, yeah. Right? So that's what we mean by supply chain. So the ability of the market to one who buys a plantain, right, in, in wholesale from the, from the farmer um, um, to, to, to deliver to, to the woman who's selling by the roadside, the, in other words, the retailer in, in, this, in this sense, that, that collaboration that happens, right, is what the competition is now. The competition is about that collaboration, that, that streamlined collaboration that happens. So have this mindset, if you're watching this, that it's not just about your idea. And you can see this image here, the best idea, when two heads come together, that's when the best ideas are there. Mm. 
Maybe now the, the last thing is on creativity and this is what i was i was talking about earlier so this is um more or less the the last two kids creativity look the future belongs to the imaginative the curious right so um some years ago i came across an article that was talking about walt disney and how walt disney started this whole idea of coming up with the character mickey mouse character and coming up with the Disney World and, and so forth. Now, at the time when Walt Disney de 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 developed the whole idea on paper, everyone said he was crazy, that it was impossible for it to happen. They said it was impossible. Today, we send our kids, in fact, most of our kids are aspiring to go to Disney World. Yeah. Based off an idea that was deemed crazy, impossible, and completely trashed. And guess what? On, unfortunately, Disney World, well, Disney died before the official um, launch. Now, at the event, the MC was introducing Walt Disney's wife, and he said that, oh, we wish Walt Disney was here to walk through you know, the park and see how everything came up. And then he called the wife to the podium. The wife said, well, I have a little bit of correction to make. Walt Disney was the first to see this place. He walked and lived in Disney World his entire life. He saw this place, he walked through it all through his imagination, right? So the future belongs to dreamers. If you are watching this and you are always looking for data to make a decision about what to do next, then first of all, you're not applying your faith. Right. The yeah. only data you need is God's word. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, only, it's only data you need. So long as so long as um you have a creative idea, you need to launch out. You need to learn to dream, right? Dreaming is is usually it's a discipline, right? You need to tell yourself that it's not always about, oh, this is not impossible, it's not always about I don't have enough money. No. The new world, like I said in the mega trend, the new world that we live in is based off originality. People are looking for original content. This is this is why, and you can see in the, in the last point there about uh, things going viral, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Originality is the new currency, right? Because remember, I mean, look, there's there's nothing new under the sun, but there's only you under the sun, right? Only one you. There's there's no other person with a genetic makeup. With with, with there's no one other person who is you. <laughs> right so you are by default you are original but you need to learn the discipline to to bring forth an output that is original right so if it's a book you want to write if it's a movie you want to direct whatever make sure that you you infuse into those ideas right and some originality something that is new something that's novel we look at someone like um I mean, really simple things for those of us in ghana we look like someone like clemento suarez for example, mm -hmm. he has a certain kind of originality to the kind of comedy he does, for example. Right? These are things that you can easily learn from. And the last bit um, is inventiveness, of course. Once you are able to um, stimulate your curiosity, you create things that are novel and literally invent new pathways um, for yourself. Um, here, I want to talk about technological literacy. Um, it's <laughs> How do I put it? It's not enough to be, how do I put it? It's, it's expensive to be ignorant in mm -hmm. the new world that we live in, right? It will cost you, right? And here, and, and for those of us watching, technological literacy is the ability to use computers, electronic equipment to meet objectives and goals and improve learning. So for example, we decided to have this meeting and then, yeah. I mean, we decided to use a tool, right? That is able to broadcast on multiple social media platforms, right? This is yeah. what we call to see technological literacy. The fact that you know that such a tool exists alone, right, is the first step. So you can see the process here is accessibility to the technological means. So the fact that you should you should put your knowledge, your curiosity out there to know yeah. which tools exist for which kinds of problems. Remember, we said problems are opportunities, but for each of these opportunities, you need a technological tool that exists. Mm -hmm. To be able to address them, and the second thing is selection, uh, selection of which means um, which which one of the alternatives that you have, 
and, and so forth. I mean, not to, not to read the slides, but basically you need to put yourself to work as far as technology is concerned, because the world is moving. Then the last bit um, would be what are the next steps? We live in what we call the experiential economy. So for those of you watching, you know, we, we, we used to be, um, if you look at the genealogy of, of society, right? Um, we used to be in the agrarian economy, right? So it's basically basic, very basic agrarian economy. You put a seed in the ground, the seed germ germinates, it produces more, you feed your family, and you, you, you go to the market with the excess that you have, and you sell on the market. So in the agrarian economy, life was simple. Our great grandfathers had that, right? And it was really quite simple because, I mean, it's really about being able to grow, to feed, right? So we have the agrarian economy. Then we have the manufacturing epoch, right? The, the, the era of, of manufacturing. So this is what happened. So let's say the grandfather sells the produce or he goes to the market to sell the produce. And then after the, uh, the, the um, after going, going to the market, he still comes back with a few bags of maize. Now the question is, how does he store that you know, bag, those bags of, of maize um, to, um, to be able to sell it another day, right? So that's when man began to think about preservatives, manufacturing. How do we process you know, the raw materials or the raw material outputs from the agrarian kind of system to be able to preserve and give it some form of longevity and, and so forth? So there's manufacturing um, economy coming into place. I mean, Henry Ford with Model S and, and so forth coming in manufacturing. So assembly line uh, was developed, you know, to to um, improve output and so forth. All this happening. Then as you as as we moved on, then it was not enough to manufacture because the other people started manufacturing. So now it wasn't really about the product. It was about how you sell the product or how you convince the buyer to buy the product. So then the service economy came in. So if I came to your establishment and you smiled at me, chances are I'll buy your product. It's just because of the smile, not because of the product, yeah. right? So the service economy was that intangible extra factor that added value to the product out of the manufacturing epoch, right? Then there's gradually a new shift that a lot of us don't know called the experiential economy. So we've, we've moved from the service economy. A lot of uh, business schools in Ghana are teaching that we are in the service economy. We've actually moved from the service economy to the experiential economy. People are looking for an experience. Right, yeah. And this is why this is why companies like Netflix, Disney World, and so forth are doing so well. People are looking for experience. People are traveling. The millennial wants to travel and have an experience, taste new foods, right? Play new games, understand you know, the new the, the cultures that exist elsewhere. And this is why the gig economy um, is becoming very pervasive. Because in a gig economy, you have a lot of control over your time. You do whatever you have to do, get your money, and go for an experience. So in the experiential economy, it is important. People are looking for experiences, right? That is why it is not, for example, it's not enough for, um, for you to just sell a product. But give people an experience while selling the product, you know, for example. So here I talk about the millennial trends. Maybe I talk about the next steps, right? So millennials are increasingly seeking unique, authentic travel experiences, right? 81% value experience over staff. So remember that the, the millennial, the new, the new um, uh, crop of people, young people, they don't care about staff. They don't care about buying a flash screen TV. That mm -hmm. is not an experience, mm -hmm. right? That's just a product. They are looking for being able to travel to Brazil, for example, immerse themselves in the culture, of what is happening, or traveling to Kumasi, or or, 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 or traveling to, to Accra. You no, know, I mean this. Um, last year, I, I was involved in a project where I, I brought some uh, some people from Germany to, to Ghana to do a project for an orphanage. You know, for example, most of them it was their first time. Now they decided to come along just because it's the first time they are going to do it. That is the experience. They are not going to be paid. They were not paid nothing, but they just hopped on and they still came. So this is important. These are the next steps. And if you're if you're watching this, this is going to affect you. You need to start thinking about an experience, the experiential economy, and and if you have a product, if you have, you have a company or whatever, you need to provide experience for your customers as well. The big question is how do I stay relevant? So I've talked about AI robots. I've talked about you know clean tech and so forth. It seems as though then the human being is no longer relevant. We are relevant, right? 
Um, first of all, AIs don't come by themselves. It takes human beings to do the algorithms, develop the algorithms and so forth. Now, the big question is how do you stay relevant? There are four things you need to do if you're watching this. Learn. And by learning, I don't mean just finish your degree and that's it. I remember very well, and, and we all did this. After after SS, some of us threw all our books away. Exactly. After high school, we threw all our books away. Uh, exactly, two poor pass forget. After university, someone, I remember when we graduated, someone said, oh, finally, finally, I don't have to learn. Look, in order to stay relevant, learn. That's the first point. And I've listed a few free platforms here. I mean, they have premium of course subscriptions, but you can get courses for free on Coursera, Khan Academy, edX, and OpenSAP. These are platforms that you can go just on your phone, on your tablet, or on your laptop, learn. The new economy is such that if you fail to learn, you'll be irrelevant. And I've, I've had personal experiences, right? I mean, and working here in Germany, believe you me, it's a different world. It's a different world. And if any one of you has worked in Germany, you can attest to the fact that they have a different work ethic, right? And if you don't learn, you, you, you'll be completely useless um, in such a system. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is unlearn. So it sounds contradictory. I'm telling you to learn. At the same time, I'm telling you to unlearn. What do I mean by that? You see, we have learned several habits. We become accustomed to several habits over the years as, as human beings. In order to survive in the new economy, right? In the new, in the new world we live in, you need to unlearn certain habits. And you can only unlearn certain habits by learning new habits. Yeah to replace the old ones, right? So if you're someone who didn't like reading, because, you know, I remember I was um, talking to someone and recently a person said, um, I don't like man. You see, you see, in the old economy, you could afford not to love man, right? You could afford, but you see, in the era of, of uh, blockchain, blockchain and of smart blockchain. contracts, <laughs> where exactly, where, where you can only get the money by breaking, <laughs> By breaking the mathematical equation, anyway. But but the point I'm trying to make is that if you have a certain mindset that I don't like math, I don't like peace, forget about those, unlearn those things. Even if you don't like math, don't say it. Right? <laughs> because the more you say, you're reinforcing yeah. it into, into your system, right? So unlearn certain habits, right? And unlearn certain paradigms, certain mind, mindsets that you have that go out for me, um, I don't like reading. You know, how, how can you survive without reading? Right, so if you don't like reading, unlearn that habit by picking up the habit of reading, right? And these days, you know, there are audio books and everything. You can easily just plug in an audio book, you know, and so forth. And the last bit here about unlearning is meditation. I believe so much in meditation. And I do that, like, I can go hours, phone off, everything off, and just meditating. And med you, med you have to meditate on God. Meditate on what his purpose is for you. you see, Purpose is, is this it's a discovery process. It's a mm. process, it's a discovery. It's not an event, it doesn't happen boom, you woke up here, I know my purpose. That's it. No. Mm. God does it for a he does it this way for a reason because he wants a relationship, yeah. right? And so it's uncovered. You know, the deeper you get into God, your purpose is uncovered. You just know. Like, for example, I started people who inspire because I was I was actually praying. I was I was I was praying one one time a few weeks back. And immediately after the prayer, the Holy Spirit just told me to do it. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, that same day, I went on Fiverr, got someone to design a logo, did a video outro and intro, and then that's it. And I, no questions asked. There are certain things, certain directions you can only get through meditation and through awesome. prayer. And you need to do that. The last bit, uh, last but one is relearn. Again, if you've forgotten your calculus, Go back and go and <laughs> relearn them just, just to stimulate your mind, right? I, I personally go back to uh, Ola Rotimi's book, The Boss <laughs> and Not to Be, for example. I mean, the, the, you need to relearn certain soft skills, right? Example, public speaking skills, presentation yeah. skills. These are things that maybe you're working in a, in, a, in a company that you don't use that much. You don't do lots of presentation. It doesn't mean you shouldn't relearn them. Please go back, uh, learn empathy, leadership, you know, and so forth. And the last one is fail forward. Failure is an essential part of your journey. And by failure, I don't mean that defining yourself as a failure in life, no. Meaning, what I mean is that there are certain projects 
there are certain steps that you take that may not produce the outcome or output that you expected, right? You move forward from that. Mm -hmm. You learn the lessons and then you move forward. And, and, and this is my last uh, slide. So I remember, and just to share this personally, because I think in the question time, I can share more of my personal journey, but the, back when I was doing my master's uh, back in Ghana, I started a restaurant um, in my second year also of my of my MBA. I started a restaurant in a hostel that I was living in. So I found an opportunity. It's how my mind works. I always I always see opportunities. So because each time you, when the hostel wanted to buy food, we either have to call or walk all the way, sometimes 10 to 15 minutes away from the hostel because the hostel was a bit secluded. So I decided there was a space there. I decided to rent it out and negotiate with the owner of the hostel. It was about maybe five or six stories high. So lots of people and I I anticipated to make money from that venture. So I did some, um, mobilized some money, you know, part of my host, my my school fees and everything. That was the risk I took. <laughs> but my school fees for that semester, you know, took some and then um, booked, uh, rented a place. I went to Malcolm, bought stuff and stuff like that. It was one of the biggest, I like, feel so miserable, man. Like, <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> You know, I started a restaurant. I mean, people were ordering and everything, you know. So I used to do Sunday, watch a special, I employed the girls. There were these ladies opposite my room. I had a deal with them. I couldn't afford to employ a permanent um, a cook or a chef. So these ladies, whenever they didn't have a lectures, they are in the kitchen cooking downstairs, you know, just some, you know, as uh, the guy said, proper movement stuff. You know, but I learned so much from that experience, right? And I now know how the restaurant industry works. Like in and out. I know what happens to raw materials, for example. There are times we we'll go to the market and the tomato uh, seller, the woman we buy tomato from, um, will tell us she didn't get some from the farm, from, from the village that she was expecting. So, again, this supply chain topic comes in. So, your, your suppliers in the restaurant business are, are your business. Without them, you don't have a business. So, I learned that uh, from that. So, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your awesome time. Awesome I hope stuff. I did not. Awesome stuff. I, I believe if this was um, a fiscal meeting, there would be a, a rousing <laughs> applause. So, you know, yeah. I'm really clapping. Awesome. And thank you for doing it almost in time. We're grateful. It was so many nuggets. I think that even 1% of the kind of um, insight you shared can transform our lives and our, our working mm. lives. Um, just one or two questions because of time, and we'll try yeah. and. Um, hope that more questions will come um, at the end when we are taking more questions but just one or two i jotted this on myself so one of the things i've come to realize is sometimes when we talk about some of these mega trends especially issues relating to um you know ai and and connectivity internet of things and stuff like that you know we are in a part of the world where we always get this impression it's uh, all these wild technological stuff that is for the west Mm. But if, here in the US, I've come to realize it works even for very simple things. So mm. I, I want to pick up your mind. What are some of the, if I should say, current, let's say, companies, businesses, normal things that we know in Ghana that most of our, our viewers are new in Ghana? That I believe yeah. maybe if you can create an example of how, say, big data or mm -hmm. of things can, can, and, and forgive me that I'm putting you on the spot to pick up something like no, that. No, no, no. Yeah, it's fine. And just simple example of maybe some of the businesses that we know of, even at the ministries or in the banks, the yeah. one that some of our listeners can relate to so that they see mm -hmm. that it's nothing, or so that we see that it's nothing that's so far yeah. from us. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, this is a very important question because, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you, you know this, I also grew up in Ghana. I mean, I did all my yeah. schooling in Ghana. So I know exactly how we most people detach you know, yes. kind of themselves from these trends. Now, let's take COVID-19, for example. Yes. Right? Data collection, for example. Yeah. What, what is the issue now? There's there's now a lot of uh, topic on, is the government really reporting the right, correct data? Let's take, for example, even the, um, the, the was it the, the street naming? Ghana was trying to do this yes. Ghana post. Yeah, uh, Ghana post, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Ghana, Ghana, G, Ghana, Ghana GPS. Yeah, GPS or something, yeah, something like that. All these things, why is the government doing that? It's because of data. Mm. Government needs data for decision making. It's, it's not because they, they look, it's not because they want you to have a fancy app. It's because of data. 
Why did they develop the COVID-19 app? Because of data. Why is it that when you're opening an account, they ask you to uh, input all that information, where you live, your address, it's because of data. If data was not important, no business would ask you for it or would even spend money collecting that data in, in the first place. So it, already you know that data is essential. Now, take this for example. Whenever you're about to board a trotro, mm -hmm. right, there's no data collected. Yeah. For example, this is a very typical, I, I think because I was thinking about coming up with a solution for this trotro. There's no data collected. Why? Because there's no ticketing system. So, yes. for example, how is the West able to tell, right, that, okay, in the next 10 years, we need to develop four railway lines in this mm -hmm. area. It's because of the ticketing system. They've collected enough data. People, when people, whenever you buy a ticket, I mean, you're out there. You, there's always from and to. Yeah. That is data. And there's also dates assigned to it. And in some cases, they even ask for your age. If you're moving yeah. here in Europe, moving from, traveling from Germany to, to, to Belgium, when you're buying the ticket, the ticket will ask for age. That is data. Mm. Now, when that data is accumulated over a period of time, you can deploy some form of AI to analyze this data for decision-making for developmental projects. And this is why our rules are not fixed. It's not because, you see, apart from the corruption, it's also because there's no data for the leaders to make a decision. Beautiful. Why? Because when you're boarding the trotter, you just bought. You don't buy any ticket. Yes. So no one knows No one knows who, are, who was in that car. That's why when an accident happens, like normally, who, who are those who are in the car? It takes like a month for us to know those who were bent or something in the tragedy. For example, because I also do um, GIS for disaster and mapping and stuff. You know, so when a fire happens, we don't even know the number of people who are in the building. When the UK issue happened, the fire burned. Like instantaneously, we knew those who are in the building because of data. So these are the practical awesome. data. Data is like is non-negotiable. Yeah. Right. It's non-negotiable. I hope this kind of helps. Yes, yes. I mean, it just reminds me of uh, something I heard or read once. It says you cannot control what you cannot measure. So yes. yeah, without that data, then yep. there's no control of things. Yeah, so yep. brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Okay, I think because of time, we will just reserve yep. the rest of the questions and move straight into our next session. Um, I, I, I know Celeste is already on, and she's going to take us to the next session. And please, for those of us listening, I know you're learning. I am very aware that you are soaking in. Please jot down your questions. Put them up in the chat box. We will share the questions and our resource persons will answer. And so it's never too late to drop your questions. Please um, make sure you drop questions. Also, it's never too late to invite someone to tell someone there's still another session. There's still question and answer time. So please share the link and invite somebody else okay so if um we can get selassie on we want to move straight into our next session i believe that selassie you are welcome i believe you are live now thank you yes so i, I believe that in our planning we made sure that um, we try to let prince focus more on the entrepreneur side and if i'm right selassie will help us answer some questions more in the perspective of the employer employee relationship as well and without uh, wasting much time, I'll just also go ahead and read Selassie's illustrious profile. <laughs> so, so Selassie Nupe, or if I should say Mrs. Selassie Adam, is, a, is passionate about supporting young people start their working life on the right footing to ensure success. As an international trade prof professional, she has had the opportunity to interview and recruit people from internship level to senior positions all across Africa. In addition to international trade, she has also led teams in microfinance, not-for-profit and real estate businesses. With the additional background in banking, telecommunications in Ghana and in the UK, Selassie understands what it takes to win in the business world. Selassie loves the Lord, I can attest to that, and <laughs> believes that as much as she has been blessed others should be able to stand on her shoulders and climb high. Again, I have known uh, Selassie personally for quite a while now, and um, she co-leads a group in Graceville's Chapel called the, the Gold Club, which does things like this, ensures that Christians become um, relevant and impactful in their business world, and also um, become kingdom financiers. So 
I know we've been blown away a second time. And so please, with more thumbs ups and comments and amens, let's let allow Selassie to have the floor. Selassie, the floor is yours. Please blow us away. Great. Thank you so much, Kwesi. Um And um, oh dear. Yeah, so I think there a bit of connectivity issues, but I'm sure she'll be back on in a jiffy. Right, so again, I'm just trying to remind us, let's continue to um, ask the question. I don't think I'm getting as much questions as I expected. So I'd like to encourage us, let's drop the questions. After Selassie's session, which will be some something about 40, uh, 30 to 40 minutes, we will take the questions um, for a while. And so please, Prince shared quite a number of things about the mega trends, about AI, about um, the clean tech and things like that. And so questions along those lines in the next step, please go ahead and share them. And as Selassie goes through hers as well, please go ahead and share them. Selassie, yes, so you are back and the floor is yours again. All right, okay. Um, I hope you can see the slides. It's not up yet, so good. It's up now. Okay. Okay, brilliant. So um, why am I calling this the new normal? Um, all over the world, not only in Ghana, we have a pandemic, um, COVID-19, which is ravaging through the world. And world systems, as we know it, have been rocked. Nothing is the same again. Um, nothing that we knew, you know, for, um, to work in an ABC manner is working that way. The uncertainty, uncertainty in, in every aspect of our lives and, and even our social lives have been affected. Um, it hasn't spared our workplace, um, if you look at it. It hasn't spared our workplace at all. For Ghana, for instance, we first had two weeks of lockdown where we all had to stay at home, mainly those in Accra and Kumasi. Um, even though we have gone back to, to work, there are, there's still some, some, some major differences in our world today, in our workplace today. You find that there are things like social distancing and, and protocols that we need to follow. So for example, social distancing that we need to um, ensure that we are, uh, um, um, uh, we are following so that we minimize the risk of getting infected. Um, even our supply chain has been affected in, in, in all businesses you're expecting, which Prince talked about. You're expecting that maybe your suppliers from China will be able to deliver your products by the certain date so that you'll be able to sell or do whatever. They are not coming or even your plantain or yam from the village to be able to reach your factory early enough for you to um, manufacture and take to the shops, it's all not happening. So everything has been affected, even customer trends. Um, yeah, now I hardly even go out. I buy things in stock and stay at home. So you expect customers to be able to come to the, to the bank or to the shop to buy things frequently, regularly. Now everybody's sitting at home using the internet just to stay safe. And and you also find that um, you are being asked, you as a business, you are being asked to do so many things. Make sure your employees have PPEs, your cost of business, your, your cost of operations has gone, has gone up. That is a situation that we find ourselves in. And trust me, this has affected every single sector and causing a lot of stress for everybody. Um, we talk about banking, is the tourism literally at a standstill, our borders are closed, nobody is coming in. Events, now people are able to um, do weddings and funerals and things, even that you need to still make sure you have your um, um, social distancing numbers, not more than 100, and make sure you have this, that fashion industry, if you're not going anywhere, why do you need to sell new clothes? You know, everything has been affected. And that really is our new normal. That is what we see now. You might think that, oh, um, maybe this will last us some um, three more weeks, one more month. It's all uncertain. We cannot tell. We pray it ends fast. We pray we find vaccines ASAP and we can all, the vaccines can reach Africa early enough for all of us to get it. 
But if you listen to the news, I mean, even the U.S. is seems to be buying all the drugs that, you know, so, so we, we can't be certain of anything that is going on. Uncertainty is a new order of the day. And you and I need to adjust as quickly as possible to a new normal, enable to survive, not only survive, but enable to, in, 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 in order to be able to win and excel. Our main role of, of any business is to make a profit. And if you sit back and wait, you, 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 are, you, you, would, you would definitely lose. You are not going to make it. Okay. So the task is for us to adjust to the new normal. Let's, uh, like Prince said, the future happened yesterday. Okay. So that's so um, I, I know you're sharing your yes. screen. Um, if you could share the projected um, screen for us, and we're that, seeing the raw slides. So maybe if you could share the projected screen. Is it better? Okay. So maybe that will come. Yeah. Because I think when it, when when it changed, maybe we'll, we are missing the changes. Of the of the slides all right can you see the projector screen now yes so that should pop up now if you could maybe share, it just pop up. the sharing and we share and you share all right all right okay sorry to to have taken the wind out of your sail there not a problem One second, I will be there soon. Awesome. Once again, I'm pushing for us to send in our questions. I've gotten a few. I'm grateful to those who have sent, but drop in your questions and um, there will be a good question and answer session. And share the share the link, like the link, and let yeah. Okay, so okay, okay so do you have the entire screen now? I believe so. We can proceed. Okay, okay. So, so the, the, today, today our, our, our title or what we are looking for here is to find out um, what skills do we need in order to be able to succeed in this new normal. Mm. What skill as employees or as workers in any organization do we need to be able to survive in this in this new normal? Um, is it hard skills? I mm. mean, is it the technical skills you need? Is it the presentation skills? Um, if you are if you're a doctor, is it you know your skills of being an expert surgeon? If you're a banker um, or or the treasury department, your skill to be able to do the calculations or an insurer to be able to do the actuarial things. Um, are th those are the hard skills. Are those hard skills the most important things that we need in today's world? Um, in able to thrive in this new normal. Um, these, I think, are extremely important. Um, however, anybody, you know, going to school, learning, learning hard in the office, understanding someone, can can learn all these skills and yeah. can can thrive. But is there anything more critical? Yes, I believe so. And these are what I call um, um, the soft skills and, and, and emotional intelligence. What we must remember is that in any business environment, the most important thing is the human being. Everything that we, we, we put out there, it goes through the human being or in human interaction. It's, 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 it's extremely high, especially even in Ghana here. I know outside, like Prince said, you, you have, um, 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 robots and artificial intelligence taking for the most part. But even that, you will still have at least one or two human beings in there. So it's about you and I. Um, we interact, we work together, and we are all humans in the end. And that we cannot, we cannot run away from. So what are those critical skills needed? That's what I mentioned. We have um, emotional intelligence and soft yeah. skills. These are what I believe in today's um, new normal are the skills that I believe that we, we, we need to practice and learn and become experts at in, in order to be able to excel. And why do I say so? Let's look at emotional intelligence. Um, if, I'm, if I try to define it, emotional intelligence is basically our ability to understand, to use and to manage your emotion or my emotion and other people's emotions in positive ways in order to be able to achieve whatever goal that, that we have. So 
in a in a work setting, we have a we have um, a goal to what satisfy clients, make profits, yeah. um, win business. We are interacting with people, but as a human being, we all come from different backgrounds, different homes to gather into that office. You have your boss, you have yourself, you have your colleagues. We all come in with different kinds of emotions. Um, some people have come excited, happy, miserable. You know, these are all examples of emotions. Some are angry. Um, their wife has upset them in the house or their children wrote, Daddy, I love you, on their car with a, with a screwdriver <laughs> and they are upset. Or they are sad. I mean, somebody has lost a loved one or going through some trauma at home. Or they are confused. They could be happy. They could be excited. These are all emotions that we exhibit, as that the people around us exhibit on a daily, on a daily basis. That um, um, we are supposed to understand. We are supposed to be able to use. We are, we are, we are supposed to be able to interpret and use it for the for the uh, for the for the good of the business environment. That is what we call um, emotional intelligence. So basically, success in the workplace depends on how you, as an individual, recognize and manage these emotions coming from your different your different um, um, people around you. So I've noted here employers, colleagues, yourself. Let's take examples. So that's it. We, we, we have to do this one more time. Um, so right. Stop. usually, when you hit F five, um, mm -hmm. you have the projector screen, and then the 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 PowerPoint itself, and I, I think when you share the screen, I, I'm, I, I believe you're sharing the PowerPoint itself and not the projector screen. So I don't know where your projection goes, but that's the screen that has to be shared. All right. So what's happening is that we see the PowerPoint, but we don't see it when you make all the changes. If you have, for example, if you have two screens, the projection goes somewhere else. Do you have all two right. screens? I'm, no, I'm using only one screen at the moment. Okay. Okay. So, I'm, you would would you want me to stop sharing and try start Let's again? Try one more time. So when you hit F F five, when you're sharing the screen, you just make sure what is selected is not the PowerPoint with all the different slides, but the one thing that um, you are seeing is what you are sharing. You know, you are not sharing like the PowerPoint software, the raw formats with everything else. Yeah. All right, so Again. I will. I think what I will try and do is to share my screen. I'll not choose the application window okay. Okay. option. I will share my entire screen. Forgive me. Uh, Forgive me. Not I, a I, problem. I, I. And hopefully that should work. Yes. Forgive me. And again, you were talking. We are talking about emotional intelligence. You are going to go straight on to beautiful, exactly. You're gonna go on to employers, so that's where we are. All right, all right, okay, good. So let's take for instance, um, our, our employers in this new normal, mm -hmm. this new COVID season, what do you think is going through your employer's mind? They are super stressed, super worried about the future. Everything is uncertain. Are they going to be able to keep all their employers? Do they have to let some go home? Um, do they have to reduce salaries? Um, are they going to be able to still win? You know, so you can imagine the kind of um, emotions going through the employer's um, system at any at any day. And he has to come to work and interact with you and other colleagues, other people, or even your colleague who sits on your right or your left. Um, he comes to work with different issues or, or, or yourself. You're also worried about the various things happening in your life or that could happen in, at your workplace. These, these are all emotions that we are feeling at every single point in time. And, and emotional intelligence is really, about, um, is really about you understanding those emotions, basically, but understanding those emotions and knowing that today, when I look at my employer, he doesn't look too excited. Oops, sorry, now I'm going click happy. Um, he doesn't look too excited and he looks worried. So I should be able to be careful with what I, what I say to him. Or this outburst he just gave is not necessarily because I'm upsetting him, but it's probably because of the emotions that is going through 
a set. So my reaction is not going to be that I'm also going to flare up and be upset, but I'm going to manage the situation better. And and um, I said that, oh, you know, uh, today my boss is not in a good mood, so I'm going to be more proactive. Um, I'm going to go to him with solutions and not only problems every single moment that boss, what should I do? Oh, should I send this here? I'm going to be more proactive with the things I am doing. Or, you know, I would, I would offer my colleague uh, a, 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 a biscuit, you know, just to some, or say something nice about him or her. Oh, you look wonderful today. Um, just because I can see that he's very, uh, he looks very sad today or looks very miserable, miserable today. Um, so that in a nutshell is um, emotional intelligence. And mm. I believe it's an extremely important skill. Uh, you, 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 you don't learn it in a day. It's, it takes time for you to um, to get used to it. And But what the, what's most important is that you, I think this is where things like meditation comes in, like Prince said, it's important for you to know yourself. Um, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are you good at? Um, for instance, myself, I know that maybe I don't operate well under pressure. So if I've been given a task, I want to be able to start that task early enough so that um, I'm not waiting for last minute and deliver a bad a job or be stressed out and take my anger out on everybody around me. Um, so that is me knowing myself and knowing what my strengths are, what my weaknesses are, and how I can bring it to the table for the, for the, for the best. Um, or, or understanding how my boss is, that he gets upset with this or not that, I mean, especially in this current situation and managing that, 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 that those emotions that are coming from him and other people around us. So basically that is emotional intelligence. Um, I talked about two things, emotional intelligence and soft skills. Um, so now I will just move on to some soft skills. And if there are, like you said, any questions on emotional intelligence, do, do note them down so that we can yeah. talk about it. I'm tempted to ask right away, but no, I'll, I'll hold on. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, you could be the best doctor, brilliant surgeon. You could be a wonderful banker, um, you know, top, top class in, in, in when, you, when you went to the banking college. You could be the best IT person, the best engineer. However, we don't work in silos. We work with people. Um, and if, if you are not good, nobody's going to come to you for a job or nobody's come to you for you to, you to do something. Um, that's why soft skills are important. Mm. And without soft skills, you will not be successful in your role because nobody's going to come to you um, to ask you for, for a job or to ask you to do anything. Mm -hmm. So what are soft skills? You can't per se measure them. Um, they are intangible. Um, so it's not like I went to school, I had five A's and a B, or I had a, a GPA of 3.98. You know, it's not something that you can measure. Um, they are intangible. Uh, they facilitate human connection. Um, they facilitate how I deal with you, why we see you would want to call me to do this presentation um, or join your team. I mean, I could, I could be, I, there are lots of people doing this yeah. Um, all around, people with a skill, with the experience. But if you don't have the right um, soft skills, um, nobody would want to reach out to you. It helps us build relationships as well and helps create more opportunities, yeah. hopefully with my interactions with you. Today's the first time I've met friends, but even with a small five-minute chat I had with him, I mean, yeah. the next time there's something to do with, um, with what data I see things, I think he's one of the people who will come into my mind that I could call on, you know, for opportunities. Why? Because he has those soft skills um, that we are looking at. So what are some of these soft skills that we are talking about? The list is endless, but I've just picked a few um, here. Chrissy, has a, has a screen It's, it's perfect. It's, it's okay. very perfect, yeah. Brilliant. Finally, I got the IT bit. Um, <laughs> So these are a few um, soft skills that we would generally use in the office or at our workplace regularly. Communication, um, both verbal and written communication, teamwork, 
your analytical skills. Um, Prince also talked about problem solving, right? Up the list there. Critical observation, um, leadership skills, your ability to change and move. That's adapta adapta adaptability mm -hmm. and even conflict resolution. So these are all examples of um, soft skills. Let's use an example. Let's give an example. You find that, um, and I think I chose the successful banker because I had a conversation with somebody actually from the rescue team talking about whether, you know, to continue with banking or the fact banking can end up being, you know, an intimidating sector if you, um, an in, in, intimidating job if you are not careful. But come to think of it, when I think of it, the successful bankers I know are not necessarily people who even did business in school or banking in school. Some are engineers and things. But what makes them successful bankers is their soft skills. Mm. So, for example, you will have a banker who is able to win a big business account for a bank, and you wonder how he did that. Let's use a Unilever as an example, um, or no, maybe I'd like to use something else. Um, uh, I don't want an I don't want a, an alcoholic um, <laughs> company. Um, give me an example of a Ghanaian business. Coca Cola. <laughs> uh, um, I don't want Coca Cola. Okay, well, yeah, we could use Coca Cola. Yes, let's use Coca Cola. Or even Unilever it still works, I think. Um, you have some a banker who is able to win like a Unilever or a Coca Cola, and you wonder how they did it. Mm -hmm. When you go with them to meetings, you would realize that they are doing this by first listening to the customer. You know, they are interacting with the customer, not only on, a, on, 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 on an extremely professional, they, they, they identify that this customer is a human being. There's a human being behind the name Coca-Cola or behind the name Unilever. And there's a human being running the operation. So we want to understand, the banker would say, you know, I want to understand your business, what is happening, what is your concern, what is your worry, you know, and, and listening to them and understanding them, he's able to, you know, provide solutions to them or able to say that, look, I'm going to go back to my bank and sit down with my, whether my boss, my colleagues, sit down with the people in the digital marketing department um, on how to create a solution for you, or um, I'm going to the trade department, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak to them. You know, he's walking to these places and interacting with people, and it's his human relations with these um, different departments and even with the clients that is making him successful. Mm -hmm. Somebody, on the other hand, would still have all these opportunities, but because he does not have good relationships with um, the people in the treasury or, or trade department or um, digital marketing, the people will not listen to him or even try and help him create a solution for his client, and you will not win that account. Yeah. So you would see that, like I said, it is not the 4.0 GPA or the fact that you top your class in banking that will help you be a successful banker, and it extends to every other um, 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 skill or every other profession that you have it's rather the human relations it's rather the soft skills that you have created mm -hmm. that you have learned over time that is going to be able to help you achieve all these things and um, you have to give a, a, a presentation to your to your client for instance and how are you communicating with him um, um, are you able to articulate what you want him to hear about your proposal or about your example are you articulating it well to him at all for him to understand these are all um, examples of soft skills that make makes one um, a successful um, banker and um, um, so in for soft skills that mainly is is the the nutshell um this is a Christian organization and we I was I was asked to also talk about whether this matters to a Christian worker at all why should um, we want to succeed in the workplace after all <laughs> like we all know we are going to um th this world is not our home we're going to all in the end leave here and go to heaven so why should i bother being successful at all in my workplace and successful at all and um, um, financially uh, you mentioned quickly about financial um kingdom financiers something that i do i believe that um as christians we are all supposed to be the head and not the tail. We're all supposed to excel in what we do so that we can... Somebody gave an example or somebody made a statement recently and, and said that 
you can be the most intelligent person, um, you can be the smartest person, have the best of ideas, but if you are poor, nobody's going to listen to you. Mm. Mm. Uh, if we had Trump, your president, <laughs> <laughs> if we had um, Trump standing there right now, in as much as some of us around the world think that, uh oh, what is Trump saying? And um, another person somewhere from um, Africa, Abu Bushi, really smart person, both of them standing there and they are both speaking, probably even saying the same thing. Who would we listen to? Mm. No, I doubt anybody will be listening to the gentleman from Abu Bushi. We would all want to be listening to Trump, even if what he's talking is in quotes um, rubbish. Well, he's because he has the money. The stock market, so. I'm, I, I, is, what, what did you say again? I bet his rubbish changes the stock market. Exactly, his rubbish moves the stock market markets upwards, and that is a truth. That is why we Christians have to ensure that we're excelling mm. in everything um, that we do. So we need to excel in the in the workplace to be able to be the head, to be able to have um, the mm. financial muscle, to be able to do the things, or to be able to be influential. And um, so I have a few things here. We Christians are supposed to be the salt of the earth. And um, um, I have Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Um, it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under, underfoot by men. So we cannot afford not to be irrelevant. Mm. Um, it also goes on to say you are the light. You are the light. But well, you can read, you can, you can read the, the rest. We're supposed to be excellent as well. If we look at Daniel, Daniel was one main person in the Bible who was um, called excellent, and um, he was somebody who loved the Lord. Um, so if we look at Daniel 6.3, it says, then, th then, this, sorry, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and, sa and satraps because of an excellence, because an excellent spirit was in him. Mm -hmm. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Wow. wow. Then diligence. You talk about diligence. Um, lots of examples of diligence. Ooh, let's read Proverbs 21, 50. The plans of the diligence lead surely to abundance, mm. but everyone who is hasty comes to poverty. Proverbs 22:29. See you a man diligent in his business. He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before obscure men. So basically, these are the things that we as Christians are supposed to be. These are the skills we, are, we as Christians are supposed to be exuding, are supposed to be showing to the world. And that is why it matters um, to be um, 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 an excellent Christian matem, um, worker. That's why it matters to be the salt of the earth. That's why it matters to be an, a, a diligent person in the workplace. We can take three examples, um, look at people in the Bible. I've already mentioned Daniel here. Um, any other examples? We have <laughs> uh, uh, any other examples you can think about? I have Joseph, Joseph I have David. Joseph, definitely. I'm sorry? I said Joseph, definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. Nehemiah, I believe, because actually Ezra was the priest. Nehemiah was not the priest, but Nehemiah was a, is a definitely another one. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, for instance, if we look at um, Joseph in Genesis 39 and Genesis 41, mm -hmm. um, it would say that, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Mm -hmm. and then in 39, 41, 39, it says, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you. Mm. You shall be you shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. So these are examples of Christians who have been. <laughs> um, okay, let me uh, let me use the word Christians to describe these people for the sake yeah, of. But of course, works. we know that it's it's working. exactly. Working. Um, um, these are examples of men who love the Lord, who mm. were diligent and excellent at what they did, and that is how what 
all of us are supposed to 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 follow and we cannot wait in this new normal um, we need to be able to adapt and move quickly and still be able to excel in what we do as christ was supposed to be the light and show others and um, give hope to the people around um, basically as a christian as a christian worker mm. um so in 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 a nutshell that really talks about i am i am a lady of few words and that really talks about emotional intelligence and um, soft skills the two skills that i believe yeah. are the most important in today's um, new normal for us to succeed in in this world and for us to be able to support our businesses and employers to achieve what they what, what they need to awesome. so thank you and uh, thank you. God awesome you. stuff awesome stuff the, i can hear the applause from all over the world <laughs> Yeah, so I think that this is great. Um, thank you so much, Celestia. The insightful stuff. I have a number of uh, questions, well, a couple of questions actually that I've put down, and I'll be going into them. I actually love what you said about Joseph and about Daniel, and something that struck me very recently, um, last month, uh, June, mm -hmm. I was thinking about is that all the things that were said about um, Daniel and about Joseph, the fact that they saw the spirit of God, or in mm -hmm. Daniel's case, they said the spirit of the gods was really because of what they had done with respect to excellence in their work. Mm -hmm. Such wisdom and insight they had displayed. The people were so amazed that they believed that they had to be a superior being. And I, I personally think it's a challenge to us Christians. We can excel so much in our in our field that when people see us, they realize now it has to be the supreme being at work in this person because they know our Christian life and then they see such wisdom displayed, such insight, such diligence. And then it shows for good. So I have two questions. Um, we'll be taking questions now. So the questions this time we have about 20 minutes. Let's let the questions flow. Um, Prince and Selassie are available. My first two, my first question will go to um Selassie, and the second one will go to Prince. So Selassie, I mean, you had mentioned that doctors, engineers all have to consider these soft skills. I think that for, for many of us, the challenge, and it's not just the Ghana challenge or an Africa challenge, it's actually all over the world. When you take what they call professional courses, engineering, um, medical mm. sciences, pharmacy, really what they are teaching you is the hard knowledge. You are learning about this thing and how to do that, and you are learning about this process. You are learning um, how to create this and this chemical equation and that mathematical formula. Really, that's what the school teaches you. So that's what you are paid to do how then can uh, a professional person when i say professional engineers doctors pharmacists bankers how then can they learn soft skills the same things mm. how can they learn them because they you graduate from school and really what has been pumped into you is the hard knowledge but we see that one thing that makes a difference is the soft skills. so how can the soft skills be learned in fact can they be learned at all and if they can't be learned how can they be learned that's my question definitely yeah, definitely they can be learned. Yeah, definitely they can be learned. I mean, you, you are right. It's an important soft skills is an important thing that should be ingrained in our educational system, and mm -hmm. um, we should start even learning it from you know primary and not 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 only soft skills, even emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. because you have let's say um, a, a child throwing a tantrum in 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 kindergarten or nursery school, and he doesn't even understand why he's doing that. But those mm -hmm. are all emotional that if we begin to teach them how to, you know, they, they grow up being emotionally intelligent. So these are things that I'm, I wish were ingrained in our educational system. However, it's not at the moment, but again, something that Prince mentioned, we need to read. There's so much in, in information out there, um, whether being a soft, so even free things out there, um, Google it, and you find so much written on these two topics already, um, or even books that you could you could um, read on. But 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 even it's just about looking at our environment and looking at those we see are successful. You realize that they are not only successful in their skill, but learning from some of these people as well. You know, so having a mentor. And, and, and learning from you, they would be able to impart some of these knowledge on you and they'll be able to shed light on some of these things for you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, I would go on to the, my question with Prince, but I don't know if he still wants to add anything to this. It's 
Or if it's okay, I can just go to my question to you. Okay, Okay. (laughs) wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. So, Prince, my question to you is one of the the questions coming from uh, one of our uh, viewers. And I think it was about the, should I call it, revolutionary statement you made about visual arts. It's like you are almost touching an abomination in Ghana, saying that, no, prepare the child to learn visual arts. Not anything, but as against, say, the science and math. The person's question is, I mean, the trend, if the trend is in not forgetting your math and still the technology and things like that, then how then does choosing visual arts over math and science become more relevant, if I should say, or become a better option? Were you saying it's factually that that is what should happen, or are you represent, are you using them, um, you know, visual arts as, uh, should I say, I don't know, an oxymoron or something to represent a particular point? Yeah. So, so yeah, th- thanks for that. So, I mean, um, because of time, I couldn't really let's say talk um, to, to deeper uh, dimensions to that. Now, look at this. We are moving to a point where there's no way, Chrissy, I know you're good in math, there's no way you can do better math than any AI. No. There's no, no way you can do a computation. Even if you're a simple calculator, the simple calculator we have now, no matter how mathematically good you are, you not Definitely. do any computations as, as good as, as that. Now, there's something Einstein, Albert Einstein said um, about creativity, that in order to be a good physicist, you need to be very good um, creatively. You need to create equations, right? And it takes a certain kind of training and mindset. And, and this, this is so important. I, I hope you ask this. Do you know Max Zuckerberg learned psychology and computer science, not just computer science? Mm. Why psychology? There, there is a reason why Facebook color scheme is blue. There's color psychology behind it. Interesting. There's a reason why you spend so many hours on Facebook. Why do you think Twitter is also a shade of blue? Hmm. You see, and, and this is what I'm trying to let you understand. I'm not I'm not trying to say that it is visual as against. Hmm. No, I'm saying let's bring these two worlds together and let's rather encourage our children to also respect visual arts, for example. You know, because for a long time now, we have completely downplayed visual arts. Yeah. But you see, I also mentioned something in my slide about creativity. Mm. You and I know, for example, in, when you do medicine, there's no opportunity for creativity. No. There's a set of, like you said, about you can't go and you're doing operation and say, well, I want to try this out. No. The guys <laughs> yeah. no, right? You cannot be creative in surgery. Yeah. Right? You can be creative in the R&D aspect, the research yeah. and development aspect of it. But in the actual profession, you cannot afford to be creative. So what am what am I trying to say? For example, in engineering, like you rightly said, I also did uh, building technology in my first degree. Now I'm working in pharmaceutical industry. So I mean, we can talk about that later. But I did, and and, and one of the key things we learned about uh, about stresses and learning about design of columns and, and beams and stuff like that. You cannot tell the lecturer, right? That, oh, I wanted to be creative, so I changed the equation, right? And I decided to add a third dimension, a Z, to it. No, you cannot be creative. So what, what am I trying to say? Our overemphasis on the, 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 the hard sciences mm-hmm. are the detriment of the creatives mm-hmm. is the issue. I'm not saying that let's now also downplay sciences and elevate yeah. visuals. Yeah. No. What I'm saying is let's not talk to our children who are going to be the... They are the ones going to face this mega trend. In fact, by if God blesses us, we live longer, we would experience. But look, our children are going to be the, the, the ones facing these mega trends. And if we don't prepare their minds now, that visual arts is as important. In fact, in some universities now, we see they are doing visual, there's someone who is doing medicine and music <laughs> as major. Yeah. Why? Because you, you, they are learning frequencies. He's learning look, the way the world is going, right? In nanotechnology and stuff like that. You cannot afford to say that the creatives are a nuisance. Mm. Last point here. Last point here. Um, I was watching uh, there's a, a boy called Jacob Barnett, right? And also another guy called Thomas Suarez. These are young kids. So Thomas Suarez, you know, was developing apps when he was 12 years. He had his first tech, tech talk when he was 12 years old. Now, we see, I was thinking about this. Jacob uh, Barnett, for example, was a professor when he was 14 years, right? So he's, he's finished his master's in 
in, in quantum physics. Mm. Now, what am I trying to say? Our children, these are the contemporaries of our children, right? And here we are, here we are telling our, our kids that the creatives are a nuisance. Our children are going to apply for the same jobs with Jacob Barnett and Thomas yeah. Suarez. Yeah. In fact, Thomas Suarez, as of today, you go to YouTube and you Google, you check him out. He's, he's developing applications on Google Glasses and has established, um, he's applied for a patent last, uh, last year for 3D, a new way of doing 3D manufacturing. He's 16 years old. Mm. Mm. So mm. we need to be very factual and pragmatic here. The creatives and the look, the new ways of doing things will not come by the rigid approach in our professional training. It's going to come by creative. It's going to take a creative mind to say that why is the why the X giving this result? Why why is the curvature of, of this of this you know of, of this steel this way? Why don't I try? And it takes the creative because usually the professionals stick to the rules. An accountant will stick to debit and credit. Whatever <laughs> there has to be balance, right? It will take someone from an outside accountant to come and say, why should there be a balance? That is what I'm trying to say. Awesome, awesome stuff, awesome stuff. Yeah. My 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 pick from this is we should get the children to one or well, we should become not just the children, we are all still young. <laughs> should become more creative. We should be able to get to a point where we ask the why question. Okay, so there's this question from Aben. Um I believe it went he went directly to Prince, but I want to um I would I would love it if you know both of you answer because I think there's an aspect that also touches on what Celasi shared. So his he's touching on the artificial intelligence again that if it's now taking over a lot of supply chain activities, the automation system specifically is what he's referring to. What advice would you give to the supply chain professional? And again, I know Prince will go to you primarily, but I also want Celasi to answer because then the idea of the new world of work now comes in and what kind of skills you think will be important for you know a professional that's in that area what things would make the person stand out so to both of you i, I guess prince can go first and then Selassie can also add your voice to this okay th thank you i mean uh, uh Chrissy, maybe yeah i mean as you know um i'm i'm been doing supply chain for some yeah. years now i did my master's in supply chain as well and um i i do supply chain my daily work and this is a very important question, Evan, and th thanks for that. Um, when it comes to supply chain, right, there's there's a whole lot, like, for example, um, issues about blockchain, AIs, and everything. There's, there's something about supply chain that makes it almost, should I say, almost impossible to be completely replaced by AI. And I'll tell you why. It's because of the collaboration that I talked about. You see, Crazy, when I call you, right, and you're not in a good mood, I can tell that, okay, today might not be a good day for this meeting. Yeah. And AI cannot do that. If I need to collaborate with someone, right, or to, to with another organization, their systems, ERP systems, should be able to communicate with mine. And now that intermediation, the technologies for intermediation do not exist yet. So for example, I have suppliers I, for some of my products like VIX and, and, and so for 7Cs, you know, I handle those brands as well. Some of my manufacturers across Europe, I also have some manufacturers in Mexico, their ERP systems cannot be integrated into my ERP system, right? Wow. Because they are, these are two different companies and there's data issue, there's privacy issue, there's, there are so many issues. So I can have a wonderful AI in my company, right? But it's completely irrelevant. That AI cannot foster the collaborative efforts effort I'm trying to attain in my supply chain, mm. right? So um, this is a very important uh, question, but as far as uh, artificial intelligence is concerned, again, it is intelligent, right? And it is artificial. It does not have structure. So you don't have an AI that can say that, oh, today when I called uh, uh, Kusio or Selassie, I realized that she was not in a good mood. So let's, I would rather hold on with this topic and then ask tomorrow. And AI is programmed to ask the question anyway, mm. right? So the soft skills Selassie mentioned, it's, it's not yet programmable, right? Completely in, in any form of AI as at now, right? So one, the collaborative nature of supply chain, where organizations need to interact uh, with each other is such that 
it's not completely possible. For example, Chris, let me give an example. In, in the supply chain, there's something we call the supply chain captain, right? So the supply chain captain is the main organization. If you take Apple, Apple gets its components and manufacturing from Foxconn in China, right? So in that supply chain, Apple is the supply chain captain. Many of us don't even know Foxconn, for example, right? But without them, Apple will not have iPhones, right? So the supply chain captain is the main entity that owns the brands and, and, and all the IPs and so forth, right? Now, usually the supply chain captain has a lot of financial muscle to buy and to appropriate AIs and automations. However, their suppliers are usually smaller companies. So there's a small company here in Germany that supplies the bolts for the iPhone, right? These companies are, are usually small, mid, medium to, you know, small to medium enterprises. They cannot afford even a cloud computing technology, how much more AI. Yet the supply chain captain needs to collaborate with them, yeah. right? So that's why AI cannot replace the supply chain. And the supply chain professional is that intermediation professional who is able to um, leverage the communication and collaboration that has to happen between the various entities in the supply chain. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff, amazing stuff. Yes, so Salasi, please, your, your, your... Uh, the prince has answered it all, talking about collaboration. I think that was, I mean, that's definitely brilliant. But, but I mean, to, to add to that, this is the opportunity for the, um, of, of course, anybody in supply chain is not like an accountant who's stuck in a box and, you know, they, they interact with people outside. But this is an opportunity for you to also develop those, um, some of those soft skills um, that you have, be, be inquisitive, um, go out and look for more for, look for more business look into all these new um, um, solutions that are being sold for um, supply chain maybe yeah. you can present that to your business or even be a seller of that so uh, the world is moving AI is taking ground but I mean people are taking advantage of it and moving from their desktop hardcore desktop where it's um, you and a computer to to like 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 um, Prince said to Prince and um, to cloud cloud solutions or other um, supply chain solutions that you you as a supply chain um, professional logistics professional can can read and learn and take advantage um, at um, take, take advantage of and be a leader in it basically so it's having an inquisitive mind and pushing out the interacting with people and finding things and learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant stuff. Okay, so I um, I have another question, and this may be um, generic. All of us, would you say, would you say that um, our country, Ghana, let me use Ghana, all of us here are from Ghana, although we are in different parts of the world at the moment, but would you say it's too, we are far behind? I get worried sometimes, personally. I get worried sometimes because I'm saying, this is the reason I'm asking this question. We had the gold, we had the, you know, all the regular resource. And if you like, it was what ransacked, it was crumbled for. We own practically little of it. And then now the new raw material, like Prince said, is data. And even with that, the, the biggest companies now are, are not us anymore. So are we far behind? If not, how do you think we can, I don't want to say catch up, but we can make it relevant to us. How do you think we can become relevant as a people um, or take advantage of these things? Yes, there are the Amazons and there are the Facebooks that are taking advantage of the newer trends and clearly they are light years ahead already. But how can we as a nation make sure that it, become, it becomes a part of us? So, Prince, you can answer it from, you know, that futuristic, futuristic per, uh, perspective. So, that's with the understanding of how business is done these days or how business is done in Ghana to how you think, you know, these things can become a part of our business culture, our life culture, more or less, in, 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 in Ghana, yeah, specifically. Anyone can go first. <laughs> I just hope my question is clear enough. Prince, you go first. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. So, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been involved in a lot of youth development activities, you know, um, for, for, for some time now, um, as, you, as you know, and sometimes I, I share in the same worry that you have. Yeah. But there is an, you see, there is an opportunity for us. And this is why I still, uh, this is why I'm at, um, I get excited with like Kumasi Hive, 
um, and, and, and such initiatives for young people to, to do things. This is where I see the opportunity. You see, at the, at the, at the start of most civilizations, right, we, the focus was on butter trade. Right? Mm. So basically, again, let me go back to my grandfather. If my grandfather had maize and his neighbor had um, tomatoes, right, they both come from the farm. They just exchange, I have extra maize, and then you give me. So it was really on hard resources. So the value of any economy was primarily based on hard resources. There was a time like that. So this is where you mentioned about the gold, the bauxite, the silver, and da, 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 da. What is happening is that the change or the shift, right, for, for the, the, or the redefinition of raw materials is now data. Yeah. Now, this is the time that Ghana has the opportunity because when it comes to data, we are all at part. Like, look, oh, yeah. there's, look, the, the, we can't say that, okay, um, um, you, have, you have more data than, data is quantified differently. It's, it's how much of it you're able to collect, analyze, right? And make decisions out of, right? So we have an opportunity. Like, for example, this um, Ghana Post GPS thing was a, was a good move. For me, even if you can't give directions using that, it gives some data. It's exactly. a specter, right? So we have the opportunity to, like you rightly said, to really um, collect as much data. Now, the other aspect is this, and at least I can speak here for myself, being in Germany, when you visit Germany, right, do you know that as of the Second World War, Germany as a country, like, was completely destroyed. Like, if you go to Berlin, there was all the buildings you see there, none of them was up. At all. Everything was destroyed. Everything bombed. Even um, two months ago, we discovered a bomb by my office, actually. And so we, yeah, so we, we had to evacuate. And then, yeah, like the, every day, even um, I think a few months ago, a bomb went off in the Frankfurt um, River. Like what I'm trying to let you know is that the, the, the issue is not about how badly an economy has been destroyed. But it's really about its people understanding that this is where we are. We need to come together to make it work. And now Germany, like everything was destroyed. Like you, when you take a tour here in Germany, like every, there was nothing, nothing, no roads. There was a time that there was, there's even a documentary on this in, on Netflix here in Germany where people couldn't get water to drink <laughs> between the First World War and Second World War. Yes, portable water. This is where we are now in Ghana. So what I'm trying, what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is we need leadership. And this is why we see, I mean, your organizations like this for me are the future. Because as you are building leaders from the grassroots, it could be five people at a time, 10 people at a time. But that is the ch that's how change happens, right? So we need to, first of all, come together. Look, let's be true to ourselves, true to ourselves. And say, look, we need to make things work. And we as Christians, for example, we need to be part of this change. And for me, this is where my worry is. Yeah, yeah. awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. So that's it. How right. can we, yeah, how can um, we? Um, I, I, it's, it's an interesting question. And I think in any part of the world, um, this is what I've learned from business. I've, mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to work both in private sector and government sector. I find that government usually lags behind and it's usually private sector that's supposed to lead and show, and show the, a nation or government that this is where the world is going to, and this is yeah. where we need to be heading towards. So I think about it's about partnerships here. Um, it's about the the, the nation of um, Ghana, the leadership in Ghana, um, understanding that it's um, private sector that would drive us to where we would go. Um, Prince mentioned organizations like yours that are developing people, and it's in developing these people. These people are starting businesses. These people are owning businesses. Is 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 up to the government to partner with them, interact with them, and be able to understand where the world is going and move towards it. Um, so that's just a little I would probably add to that. Awesome, awesome. Um, we, I'll just, well, our time is just up, but there's just one last question that came in, and um, I'll try and read it. That this came through, and it says that, okay, let me try and, give me a second, I'm trying to coin the question. It says, so what is the, the place of leadership in being able to or and indeed in followership in being able to 
allow originality to express. So I'm guessing the question is about, we know, I mean, creativity, original, originality and stuff are important for the new trend. So as a leader that has a vision and you have a goal and you know where you want to go, or as a follower that has been given a vision and there's a goal where it has to go, how, how does that coexist with creativity, with originality and things like that to be able to, you know, I mean, for, for the common good, how, how how do those things play together? Having a goal, having a vision as a leader or having instructions as a follower and allowing creativity and originality to, ex to be expressed. So let's talk to leaders and followers. Um, I'll go first. Go first. Um, it's, it's, I think it's, a, it's, it's not an easy one, especially in a country like Ghana, because creativity is expensive. Yeah. It's something you need to invest invest yeah. into and not expect um, results in six months, one year. It could, like, like, like Prince said, that he's tried businesses and mm -hmm. some were complete failures. It could fail completely. Mm -hmm. It could be a lot of money. You would have people bashing you. Why did you spend money? But but if we don't invest, if we don't sacrifice and do that, we are not going to get anywhere. So uh, we're going to have to pay the price somehow, I think, and then and, and, um, allow creativity to be fostered. Um, um, whether it is businesses, I'm, 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 sh I'm sure that is why the, the big companies, Unilever's and Coca-Cola's are doing that because the R&D um, um, departments are thriving. They are funded. Funny. And uh, for, you know, even in this season of COVID, how much money do we have for researchers in, in, in the science to be able yeah. to develop something? It's, it's an investment we need to know that may not pay back anytime soon, but we need to make, whether on a government level on a, or a private sector level. Mm. So you should understand the kind of investment you're getting into and the risk that comes with it. Awesome. And also the better rewards that will come after. Awesome. Anything to add uh, from your yeah. side? So, so on, a, on a very micro level, and I'm, this, I'm trying to reconcile, like you said, you know, leadership and how you can adapt creativity in order to foster a strong followership as well. And, and for me, this is where the gap is, um, leadership. A lot of a lot of times when things don't go well, um, especially in Ghana. I mean, I, I grew up in Ghana. I only left Ghana recently, not long ago. So I'm a, I know the system quite yeah. well. And exactly, I'm a, I'm now a Siano boy. After, after. <laughs> so um, I've come to understand that when, especially when something happens, I was, I was saying this that um, people would, would usually say, "Well, it's, you can also blame the followers and stuff like." That. The, it's easy to to say that, but you see, the, the, that's the essence of leadership. Mm -hmm. If 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 the 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 whole at the end of the day we are going to blame the ordinary follower, then there's no need for leadership. Mm -hmm. You see, a leader is someone who has been first of all trusted with a certain kind of mandate to influence people, yeah. to even in most instances influence them to do what they would not ordinarily do, right? So ordinarily, I would want to cross the road anytime I want to cross, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it takes a leader to give me a budget for um, traffic lights with pedestrian um, signals as well to be able to, for me to obey that, right? So it's, it's really, at the end of the day, everything is leadership, right? And if for example, we are not able as a people to, to find the right leaders, then it's going to be almost impossible with whatever we are doing at the grassroots. You see, when, when we, well, like what we're doing now, we, we are doing our best and everything. At the end of the day, if by tomorrow, right, God willing, I'm going to apply for a tender, there's, there's a tender, um, a request for a proposal or something, RFP somewhere, and I'm going to apply for that tender. And the system is such that I need to pay a bribe before my RFP will be looked at. Then the, this meeting, like the input of this whole meeting is negated at the end of the day. That, that, that's the point. The point I'm trying to make is, as Christians, yeah. our mandate is about influencing the world. Mm. That is leadership. Leadership is not about the position that one has. It's about the opportunity God has given you in your space to influence. 
It could be influencing your brother who is a drug addict. It could be influence. It's all about influence. And this is why Dr. Marsh Moreau always says this, that this is why when the day you got born again, God did not kill you the following day to go to heaven. Right? Because that's the easy way out. He still kept you here. Let your light so shine before men mm-hmm. that they may see your good works. Not God's good, your good. So even God is saying that the light he has given to you is to it's yours, like it's yeah. it's your property, right? That's what the scripture said. It's your light, mm. your works, and then the glory goes to God. Although it is your works, it is your light, the glory goes to God. Goes to God. So if you're watching this, leadership, influence, creativity, whatever it is, all comes down to influence. Awesome. Beautiful stuff. I this has I am blown away. I was trying to you know, I was trying to moderate and take notes and it was not easy because there was nuggets after nugget after nugget after nugget and it's been amazing god bless so much i'll just let, let each one of you have just the maybe a minute final word and then we'll, we'll, we'll end so just one final word from from each of you and then we'll be done with uh, i i i just want a question coming uh, oh man okay there's a question that just came in, but our time, our time, our time, our time is so up. Um, I'm just, okay, let's take this question. We'll take this question, and then that'll be our final word, and then we'll be out. So this question is coming from Kaylin. Kaylin is of special interest to our sister Celastic. So Kaylin says, how do you foresee the future of e-commerce and the world economy in the event that starts on COVID-19 gets worse? Um... And what areas would be best to invest in the event of such a shift? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I know Kaylin. He doesn't ask easy questions. <laughs> so, yes, please. This question is for Prince. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. So, I mean, when it, when it comes to e-commerce, I mean, let's, let's look at this. E-commerce is all about transactions, right? So, we're looking about, we're talking about um, basically being able to do a, a transaction electronically. So either you want a transaction to be done for a good, a service or product, whatever it is. There's a, there's a, there's a twist here because you see with e-commerce, there's, there's intermediation of usually a bank, right? So for example, if I wanted to pay for anything, uh, buy something on Amazon, I need to use my credit card or my debit card or my bank account. So there's, there's some form of intermediation, right, where another entity serves as a middleman and then ensures the transaction happens and gets their cut. Mm-hmm. The e-commerce we know now is not going to be the e-commerce tomorrow because of blockchain. Because you see, with blockchain, this intermediation no longer exists. So there's no mm-hmm. bank. I can do a transaction with a vendor without any bank mm-hmm. with blockchain technology. But I, of course, that's also another topic. But I want you to understand, Kevin, that the e-commerce, as you know it, where there's an there's some form of intermediation, is not going to happen anymore. Already, I've been in. I spoke at a conference in in the UK last year, and where we looked at blockchain itself, and it's crazy, like smart contracts and all that. There's no intermediation, right? So it's really P to P, peer to peer form of uh, transaction, right? So it's peer to peer. There's no bank involved. So imagine that I can send, we see ten thousand dollars, for example, without any bank getting involved. That is where we are going to. So with that question, uh, Kaylin, just reconsider this, that the e-commerce you know now is not the same e-commerce you are going to see in the next 10 years. Trust me on that, because blockchain is moving forward. And the other part of the question that he, he talks about, which areas best to invest? In my view, and this is um, my personal view, invest in people. Mm. Um, and 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 I'm very and this is why I, I I started Kumasi High with my with my partners because we want to invest in people. This is where, in my view, we cannot go wrong. Is when you invest in someone and the person is able to get somewhere in life. You don't you change a generation. Look, if I buy a laptop, I have bought a laptop. Fine. It, look, my great grandchildren who don't care whether I, I own the laptop or not. No one, no, it, it, no one cares. If you buy the next iPhones, no one cares. But if you are able to invest in someone, right? So it could be a startup founder, it could be, you know, um, a street child, whatever it is. 
that investment changes usually a whole gen gen generation, right? So someone can look back and say, oh, was that uncle who paid my fees at that time mm -hmm. that enabled me to get my degree? And this is where I am. Mm -hmm. And now, one, that memory of that help kind of reinforces the person's goodwill and is able to extend or pay it forward, one. Secondly, the person's life changes forever. So, uh, Kelly, if you want to invest, my view is, first, invest in people, the people around you, the, the, the startups, and invest in the knowledge, right, of what is going to happen in future. And that, for me, would be the best approach. Awesome. Awesome. Salasi, final word. Final word. Final word. I'm... I've learned a lot today. I mean, especially from Prince. And I, I think my final word to all of us would be, it's time for us to take a moment and reassess where we are um, in terms of our lives, in terms of our work, in terms of um, entrepreneurship and, and re-strategize, be intentional about what we are going to do next. Yeah. Um, whether it's a soft skills we want to learn, be intentional about putting an effort into learning those skills to develop yourself whether it is um, some AI or blockchain technology you want to learn, be intentional about going to find those um, free educational things or even pay, um, ones that you pay, be intentional about your future because it's not waiting for us and um, we are being left behind and we need to catch up and, and, and be, be the leaders we are going to be. Amazing stuff. This has been just, like I said, nuggets after nuggets after nuggets. And my, my take away two things. The first one is... Um, when Selassie said that whether you are an engineer, a doctor, an accountant, what kind of professional you are, if you don't have soft skills, you still can't get business. And that that is hitting different for me. And then also, actually, so for Prince, there was one I had, the learn, relearn, learn, let me learn on learn, relearn, that, that first part. But then what you just said right now, probably has taken the first spot that invest in people. The best investment you can make is in people. God bless you so much. And um, this has been wonderful. And we want to thank everybody that joined us to view. I want to especially thank everybody that was connecting with us for the very first time. Both of our speakers are connecting with us for the first time. And yet, they have been such a blessing. God bless you. And everybody that's viewing on, 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 our, on our platforms, thank you. So a few announcements. Firstly, you can subscribe to our websites, um, www.rescueworld.org, to receive updates and resources from Rescue World. And we have a few events coming up. Like I said, we are an outreach ministry in the very full essence of it, but we do all these things. And on 15th, we have a breakfast meeting. Again, all these have changed. This, the, the nature of our meetings have changed because of the new normal. And it's actually making us benefit more. Our last event, we had a speaker all the way from, from the US. Now we're having a speaker in Ghana, another in Germany. And so... It's definitely going to be a blessing. Please join in. We have Young and Free, a gathering of young people on the 29th of August. The breakfast meeting will be on 15th, will be on 15th August. Then we're praying on the 12th of September, and we have what we call a marriage clinic on between the 25th and 27th. Um, then in October, another breakfast meeting we have on Censored. Quite a number of activities coming up all the way to December. And we will be applying our innovation efforts. But what I want to take note is the breakfast meeting on 15th and 29th, young and free. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Once again, I'd like to thank you so much, Selassie and Prince. And we really look forward to connecting with you some other time, another way, some way, somehow. And if, um, I mean, things are changing, so maybe a physical meeting may not be as dire as it's, as it's needed. But if that would happen, we'd be so excited to have you physically sometime. God bless you. We'll definitely call upon you guys one, one more time, someday sometime. And um, it's been great having you. I'll close with a prayer. And so um, wherever you are, you can join me as I pray. Father, we are grateful unto you, again, for such insight, such depth. We are certain that everything that was shared today didn't just come from Selassie and from Prince. We know you spoke through them because they were great insights and they're such a blessing unto us. We are praying for grace. Grace that will be able to take these tools, take these lessons, have these soft skills, have these